everybody. Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Terry Stiles with my co-host, Jim Hughes. Hello. Welcome back again. Thank right? you. Good. <laughs> and in this week's news, the end conviction draws demands from parents, state of the community over chamber breakfast, and music season with the end of winter sports. All that and more. The Oxford News begins right now. Last week, the father of the Oxford school shooter was convicted of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. The decision brings an answer to the question of whether parents can be held criminally accountable for their child's shootings, as both the father and mother have been convicted on the same charges. The Detroit Free Press reports that after closing arguments and a 12-hour jury deliberation, the verdict was announced and brought sighs of relief from the families of the victims. The father now faces up to 15 years in prison. Both he and the mother are scheduled to be sentenced in April. Currently, however, authorities are now also investigating threats that James Crumbly allegedly made against a prosecutor which assailed that she would receive consequences after he was released from prison. Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bruchard, Michael Bruchard sorry, released a statement after the conviction stressing the victims of the tragedy and the community have his unwavering support. He said that as this is the last criminal trial, he prays that in the days ahead there will be less traumatic times and more peaceful ones for all of us. Jim? As an addendum to that last story for the parents of the students killed in the shooting, Criminal convictions of the family are not enough, actually. The Detroit News reported last week that the group called the Statewide Task Force to investigate the emergency response spoke up for mandatory statewide threat assessment policies, even urging the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals on March 18th. The parents held a press conference to voice their demands of accountability and change. These include investigations by the Michigan Attorney General's Office with the immediate removal of school board members leading to the district at the time of the attack and the creation of a state agency focused on firearm violence prevention. Lawyers for the families are currently urging the 6th U.S. US Circuit Court of Appeals to affirm a lower court ruling that two officials were not entitled for qualified immunity. Qualified immunity protects government officials like Counselor Sean Hopkins and Dean of Students Nicholas Ejack from civil lawsuits and the unconstitutional action, and it's not clearly established. Madison Baldwin's mother, Nicole, said she believes a threshold of over, to overcome governmental immunity would incentive uh, school systems to prevent mass shootings in the future. Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald also said on March 18th that she has not even seen evidence to support criminal charges against the Oxford school system, officials leaving civil charges as the only alternative hope for the parents to appeal with support. Terry. Only three candidates remain in the search for the Oxford Community School Superintendent. At a special board meeting last week, the three candidates met with students, staff, and subsequent community stakeholder meetings through the, last, the week of last week. It was a busy week for the finalists, Cormac Lynn, David Raleigh, and I think her name is Tanya Milligan, and each will have final interviews on April 2nd. The candidates included a current superintendent from Kentucky, an assistant superintendent from Ohio, and an assistant principal from Michigan. In previous interviews, the candidates stressed various aspirations and qualifications, including a desire to be closer to the community that they will serve. The commitment to a character and building relationship uh, regime. They stress prior experience with significant trauma. The recorded interviews are available on OCTV YouTube and Facebook. Facebook. And for more information about those candidates, you can go to the Oxford Community Schools website. Good luck to all. Jim? In a much debated topic and one that came to a conclusion, the Oxford Township Board of Trustees approved a single waste hauler. The request for proposals during the meeting took place on March 12th. 
The single waste hauler debate has been in and out of trustee meetings for the last few months. In December, the Board of Trustees voted unanimously to put the decision on whether the township should switch to a single waste hauler system. Before voters on the November 5th general election ballot, Supervisor Jack Curtis says now that the only reason the township is going out for bid on the single waste hauler, and if so, the price point would be known that the, the way the elaborate could uh, choose a company and vote for whether to have a single hauler, knowing whether the decision would save or cost the township money. The request for the proposal is for all parts of the waste and recycling process. The bids will be received up until April 11th at noon, and the township board will then evaluate, interview, and make selections up until the 1st of May. The board will also decide whether to officially authorize the ballot question on the May 8th election. Terry? The Oxford Chamber of Commerce held the 2024 State of the Community Breakfast and Leadership Awards last week to a sold out crowd enjoying a, an ace buffet supplied by Chef Brian at Independence Village. Speakers discussed the past year's successes and gave updates on the future of Oxford. The Chamber presented two leadership awards for a commitment to serving others and bettering the community. One to Polly and Trail Manager Linda Moran and the second to longtime Chamber member and business owner Deb Uren. Among the speakers were Township Supervisor Jack Curtis, who reported on the many successes of the fire department, the clerk's office, the library, and the community as a whole, and the total taxable value of over $1 billion and nearly 18,000 registered voters. Village manager Joe Madore spoke of the increased tax revenue that they received that will fund the parking lot at the village offices. The DDA director Kelly Westbrook spoke of many updates to the downtown social district and county commissioner Mike Spiz informed business owners of the many programs the county has available to assist businesses in the community. If you missed it, you can watch the full live stream on OCTV on our YouTube channel and our Facebook, Oxford Community Television YouTube. Jim? The Oxford Downtown Development Authority has started a podcast. The Downtown Diaries with Kelly and Kimberly, Oxford's DDA Executive Director Kelly Westbrook and Project and Media Coordinator Kelly Smith, who we've all worked with, are the host of the podcast and will feature information on what the DDA does daily and what they're working on and upcoming events they are hosting in the community. It will also host special guests to share information about the businesses, projects, and any other information Oxford residents should actually know. The Downtown Diaries with Kelly and Kimberly premiered on SoundCloud on March 12th. The first episode, an interview with manager of the Village of Oxford, Joe Medor, went up on March 21st. Medor discussed current upcoming projects and how the DDA helps to support the Village's strategic vision in the teaser episode. Uh, Westbrook and Smith called for business owners and community members interested in being on the podcast to reach out, listen to the podcast, and visit uh, Orion Neighborhood Television's local voice SoundCloud page. Sounds like a pretty interesting thing. Maybe we can get it here at OCTV. Terry. Mm, yeah. In this week's Behind the Lens, be our guest. Theater students at the Oxford High School invited the community to do just that in their production of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. As the selection for the annual musical, the students outdid themselves, performing eight shows of the tale as old as time. For more than 60 students involved, they were not only actors, but singers, stage managers, and crew also. Take a look at these snapshots of the costuming, lighting, set design, talent involved in the production, which one theater goer, goer said the cast and crew put on a show that could have been rivaled by the professionals. Good for them. Oh yeah, look, I was looking at our monitor and it looked like <laughs> really? Broadway stuff there, right? Yeah, really good stuff. Oh yeah, so my sister went and she was just amazed at what those kids did. And it was a long play. It was almost three hours and she said nobody faltered. It was great. Very good. Yeah, good, good stuff for them. Uh, from the yeah. drama department out there. Good for them. And, we're looking forward to seeing some of that stuff in the future as yeah. well. And in our last story, Terry Stiles will talk about playtime for all. Up next, you know him, you love him. Dave Kenny will have a lot of talk in science in the news. 
You are watching Oxford News This Week right here on Oxford Community Television. We'll be right back. Military families often sacrifice precious time away from loved ones while serving our country. And for those with children, the separation can be especially difficult. We were worried that with him leaving, that she would lose those connections with her dad. Some of life's best moments happen between parents, children, and the pages of a good book. United Through Reading provides that connection. You can watch your mom or dad read a book to you, and it almost feels like they're really there. We ensure they remain a consistent, meaningful part of their children's lives, no matter the distance. Just seeing Jacob recognize Daddy again after a long time just melted my heart. And now, as we're facing greater isolation from our loved ones, United Through Reading is also available to veterans. Learn more about United Through Reading and download our free secure app at unitedthroughreading.org. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and this story is taken from Automotive News. <clears throat> Tesla Incorporated's second-generation Roadster will feature rocket technology through a collaboration with aerospace company SpaceX that will allow the sports car to accelerate from zero to 60 miles per hour in under one second, says Elon Musk, CEO of both companies. Musk, in an interview released March 4th with former CNN journalist Don Lemon, suggested the future sports car maybe can fly. It's not out of the question, said Musk in a response to a question. Musk later, or he said last month, that the new Roadster, which was first presented in late 2017, will launch next year. The first generation Roadster was Tesla's first car to go on the market in 2008. During his appearance on Lemon's newly created Don Lemon Show, Musk said the Tesla collaboration with SpaceX will allow the automaker to create a vehicle that can top the Cybertruck pickup, which launched in November. Musk said the Cybertruck is Tesla's best product to date. The only way to do something cooler than the Cybertruck is to combine SpaceX and Tesla technology to create something that's not really a car, Musk said. Of the Roadster, it's going to be really cool. It's going to have some rocket technology in it. When Lemon asked if it would be a flying car, Musk said maybe, but not out of the question. Musk said it will not have big wings, but will feature a yoke-style steering wheel similar to controllers used in modern jets. I've got to reserve the cool stuff for when we actually unveil it, Musk said to Lemon as he asked for more details. Musk said the Roadster will have totally Jetson vibes, referring to the 1960s cartoon with iconic flying cars. On Tesla's website, the current description of the Roadster, which is open for reservations with only a $50,000 deposit, estimates a 0 to 60 miles per hour time of 1.9 seconds and a top speed of over oh, 250 miles an hour. Musk originally promised that it would be available in 2020 at a starting price of $200,000 before shipping. Musk previously mentioned a possible SpaceX collaboration in June of 2018. SpaceX option package for the new Tesla will include uh, around 10 small rocket thrusters arranged seamlessly around the car he wrote on Twitter before he bought the social media platform and renamed it X. These rocket engines dramatically improve acceleration, top speed, braking, and cornering. Maybe they will even allow a Tesla to fly, Musk wrote. Some of Musk's predictions for Cybertruck, including a 2021 launch and a low base price, proved optimistic when the pickup last arrived last year. The interview between Musk and Lemon was originally going to be the first in a series of collaborations between the now independent journalist and the billionaire businessman on the X platform. But Musk canceled their deal and the interview was taped and before it was broadcast, both men have said. Well, that's it for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny. Wait for that new Tesla. Stand, stay tuned to Oxford Community Television.
in every 500 African Americans in the U.S. suffers from sickle cell disease. One in three African American blood donors is a match for patients with sickle cell. One appointment to donate blood with the American Red Cross can help save a life. Will you be that one? Visit redcrossblood.org slash ourblood today to schedule an appointment at a location near you. Welcome back to Oxford News this week. Oxford Sports, Oxford's powerlifting teams competed in a varsity state meet that was at Lake Orion High School on the 9th of March. That was a Saturday made up from students of Oxford High School and the Oxford Virtual Academy. Oxford boys varsity team finished fourth in the state. The girls varsity team finished 12th in the state. Eight Wildcats finished with the top 10 in their weight class. Carter Kitchen, uh, Joey Masario, uh, both took second place. The highest scoring out of the group, Emilio Debo and Michaela Sedlock were the highest finishers for the girls, both coming in fourth place. Congratulations to the powerlifters on their strong end to a great season. Speaking about powerlifting, while well, the winter powerlifting season, or winter season is over for sports, the turnover between winter and spring sports is happening right now. Let's wrap up some of the recaps of what happened this past winter for the Wildcats in the successful season. Oxford Athletics had one league champion in boys bowling, one state final qualifying teams in girls bowling, one individual state champion who won two state championships in boys swim and dive. There were also multiple individuals, top three finishes and top three team finishes within their respective divisions. Uh, the six sports all brought the Wildcats to successful seasons. For more details about their accomplishments, visit the Oxford uh, Sports website. It's right there at your fingertips, OxfordStrongAthletics.org. That's going to wrap it up in sports. Uh, we'll pick it up with one more story. Terry will have the last story, and Dave Kenny, I believe, has another segment. You're watching Oxford News this week. Women are bad with money. It's what the world's been saying for centuries. But now, we've got something to say. Save it. Save the old-fashioned advice, the empty excuses. It's all worthless, unlike us. To our fellow females, it is time to save ourselves by saving our money contributing to our futures, investing in our independence. Until we're no longer 80%, 80%, 80% more likely than men to live in poverty in retirement. So again, we say to that, save it. The falsehoods, the feelings of fault, then the funds. Learn how to save for your retirement at wesaysaveit.org. Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and this story is taken from New Scientist. Babies born to bilingual mothers who are exposed to two languages in the uterus exhibit different brain responses to speech-like sounds at just a few days old compared with those born to monolingual mothers, further suggesting the influence of prenatal experience on language acquisition. Newborns have a preference for listening to speech over non-speech sounds and can distinguish between different languages based on their rhythms. Previous research has shown that four-month-old babies living in bilingual homes have distinct patterns of brain activity, but it was unclear how prenatal exposure to more than one language affects much younger infants' brain responses to speech. To investigate, Sonia Arenas Alcón at the University of Barcelona in Spain and her colleagues recruited 131 full-term babies aged between one and three days old, 53 of whom had mothers who spoke only Spanish and 78 of whom had mothers who spoke both Spanish and Catalan. They played the babies a series of OA or O sounds for a quarter of a second each while scalp electrodes recorded their frequency following responses, a marker of brain activity that reflects the efficiency with which speech sounds are processed. 
These are generated by the synchronized activity of the neurons in the brain's auditory processing pathway and are known to be disrupted in a range of speech and language conditions. The researchers found that the babies born to bilingual mothers exhibited a lower so-called signal-to-noise ratio in response to each sound compared with those born to monolingual mothers. This measures the strength of this desired sound signal relative to any background noise with a lower ratio indicating better quality neural patterns. Bilingual speech contains more complex sound signals than monolingual speech, so babies born to mothers who speak more than one language are more sensitive to speech frequencies, the researchers write in their paper. There were no differences among the babies within either the bilingual or monolingual groups, which suggests that the, their distinct brainwave patterns were the result of their language exposure in the uterus rather than what they heard in the first few days of life. This highlights how exposure to multiple languages during pregnancy affects the neural encoding of speech sounds at birth and serves as compelling evidence that the intricate role of prenatal experiences play in shaping early language acquisitions, says Nayeli Gonzalez Gomez at Oxford Brookes University in the UK. This builds on previous research that shows babies may start to learn language before they are born and emphasizes the potentially vast cognitive cap capabilities that fetuses are capable of, she says. Studying this helps us better understand the beginning of language acquisition, which may be affected in premature babies if it starts in the uterus, says Gonzalez Gomez. Those are smart little babies. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. When a crisis hits close to home and across the globe, nonprofits are on the front lines ready to serve. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. The demand for charitable services has skyrocketed, and nonprofits are rising to meet the needs. Healing, nurturing, rescuing, honoring, protecting. Caring, inspiring. The work of philanthropic organizations of all sizes across all missions has never been more important. And it's donors and volunteers like you who make all this possible. Thank you. Together, we change the world. The Nonprofit Alliance. Your password isn't secure. There's nothing that a hacker loves more. But there's an easy thing you can do to prove the logger in is you. Authenticate strong, authenticate. Make your logins extra safe. Protect your identity from tragic fate. Authenticate strong, authenticate. Use your fingerprint, your face, or a code At home or work or on the road Two steps are safer than one Or three or four And keeping data safe is so much fun Authenticate strong, authenticate Make your logins extra safe Protect your identity from tragic fate Authenticate strong, authenticate In our last story, it's playtime for all. Seymour Lake Township Park's new, accessible, inclusive playground opened earlier this month. Out of the playground's 22 elevated play components, 13 are accessible by ramp and 18 by transfer systems, which allow users to reach without a wheelchair or mobility device. The playground has two towers, five slides, swings, assorted climbing elements, and other components designed to promote physical, social, sensory, and cognitive 
development. After local parents requested fencing to help protect children who tend to wander, that final element will be added in the coming weeks, thanks to donations from Clark Fund, the Rotary Club of Oxford, and Dan Davis. The playground protect the project was made possible through a $125,000 grant from the Game Time M Parks statewide funding initiative. That's really cool. Five times fast, and but really I tell you, cool. good stuff. I, you know, the funny part is, is I kept thinking. You know, we, we read that story a few weeks ago. That why are they replacing it already? Because of the, the other new stuff. The other new stuff's not new. I mean, no, my I kids know. are like thirty and thirty-three, and they played on I it. Know. But I mean, for you and I, like we think, you know, yeah. it's like new it just stuff. Happened. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, it's good that they have stuff that yeah. uh, that's accessible to yes, all. Yes, it, it really is. I know um, Friendship Park in Lake Orion uh, um, installed that kind of equipment a couple years ago, and I've seen on Facebook by mothers so many times saying, "Thank God for that. My kid really can interact with the other kids now." And oh, it's nice. just great that we were able to do that thanks to the grant. And I'm sure that's a grant that um, CJ probably wrote from the time township their um, communications director and grants manager right so now like like, awesome. like with the with that I'm telling you out here at Seymour Lake Park I mean we just so happen to be in the and out here as well our TV mm -hmm. station but if you I mean you can bring come out here the kids can play the the markets open you got baseball fields what a place pickleball mm -hmm. tennis yep. whatever it's all out here in the park shuffleboard and, yep. and it I don't think you know doing all this stuff costs a lot of money to do that golf you know? frisbee golf yeah no and and like you said when our kids were little, I remember it being just a ruddy dirt road to get out here to the baseball park right, right in yeah. the back. There's soccer and everything else here then now. They, it's just yeah. great. Then, what, what did they, I forgot the name it was, K Kingdom Kids or Kids Kingdom. Kids Kingdom, Kingdom. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, to me, I come in the then. other day and I started thinking, <laughs> well, God, they're 30 and 33, so I guess it is kind of old, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Still National yeah. Reading Month here as we go on. I got yeah, a little gem for you to find out. I didn't read anything this week, but other than the news. Um, down, I believe it's in Ferndale. It's called John King Books. Okay, mm -hmm. it's like a one tank trip. I mean, I know we have bookstores around yeah. here, but if you want to yeah. head down Woodward Avenue, there's a place there. They, I guess they've got everything in that bookstore. Are they used books or used um, books? Yeah, oh, used how books. Fun. And, yeah, yeah. And I mean, and you go in there, and I mean, yeah. I couldn't tell you what the price point was, but yeah. uh, they were featuring that. Called, it's called John King Books again. Okay. I've been one or two times myself. Mm -hmm. Again, I need to get back into the reading. So where yeah. are you at this week? That's everybody I have, wants I to know. I started a new book actually this morning. It's called The um, Hunting Party by Lucy Ferber, I believe her name is. So um, it's the same writer that I've been lis okay. listening to her yeah. books for the last couple months. But gosh, I think I'm since January. Right. I've been through at least six books just listening to them, you know, in my car cool. or getting ready for work rather than watching the news and getting depressed about what's going on. You're going all I'm over the world, books. like you said I last am. week. Yes. Now, this time, um, this book is in Ireland. So, oh, that's you like that. Yeah, right. And again, it's like exciting. I say, not only is March, you know, National Reading, I mean, you can take this all the way into the summer or whatever, take a book to the beach or whatever. Again, I'm living vicariously through you and reading. i got to get going on that myself. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you all about them. I need to correct it. It's Lucy Foley. Sorry about that. Okay, Lucy, Lucy Foley, Foley yep. in case you're watching. Okay. Good writer. Anyways, uh, that wraps it up for this one. Another great uh, time to have you join us. As always, thank you for uh, our news gathering sources. Mm -hmm. This week's news gathered from the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. Oh, and also we have other, other news gathering sources like the township and all sorts of areas. Again, we want to thank... <sighs> Uh, you for watching. OCTV can mm -hmm. be viewed on Spectrum Charter Channel 191, Channel 99 on the ATT UVerse system. Check us out on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, or even Roku. If you have a show idea, maybe you'd like to be a volunteer, you can contact OCTV. Give our office a call at 248 628 9658. Special thank you to producer, director, and editor Kyle Snage. He's, uh, he does all three. Yeah. News writer Allison Miller, programmer Connie Miller. Our station manager, Terry Stiles, who likes to read via tape and also an anchor for everyone here at OCTV. Jim Hughes, hoping you have a safe week. I invite you back next time when, again, Terry and I will take a look at Oxford News this week. Have a great week. Bye-bye.